Arbeitskreisleiter. Uh, thanks everyone. Um, so I'm Roy Dash from UNSW and today my talk is uh, uh, Unsupervised Machine Learning Framework for Discriminating Major Variants of Quant Consent During COVID-19. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming to this talk. So uh, this is a very brief overview of the talk. And so those of you who are kind of new to machine learning or data science, there's like machine learning algorithms generally can be classed into two major areas. One is supervised machine learning and another is unsupervised machine learning. So just at the term itself, basically unsupervised refers to data which is not labeled, you know, so unlabeled data. So whereas supervised machine learning is based on label data, or there's also semi-supervised learning and others as well, where there's some label data, so that's semi-supervised learning. So if, uh, what is data, you know, what's the labeling in data? So for example, like if you have, uh, you know, a data set with heart diseases, of patients for last 10 years, then, uh, you know, doctors would have said, oh, this has, patient has heart disease, this patient doesn't have a heart disease, you know, so there's, and basically that, that's the label, basically, and there may be features as, uh, you know, kind of blood type, uh, BMI, and all those features can be there, and basically that's when you use su supervised machine learning methods, mostly deep learning methods, they are used to, you know, guide do doctors, can guide doctors that, you know, somebody has, give some probability if somebody is going to have a heart disease, you know, so more for screening uh, patients, you know. So that's just one example of uh, supervised machine learning. And there are many others, you know, like uh, all the, you know, autonomous uh, driving car, there's, you know, antivirus uh, detection and spam detection in, that you get in your emails and there's like recommend systems. A lot of things are on uh, social media running, a lot of algorithms on social media running are using supervised machine learning. Also face uh, recognition, for example, is again, supervised machine learning. Unsupervised is when you do not know the levels. So, uh, Unsupervised face recognition would be like you have a data set of many different faces and then you lack some unsupervised machine learning algorithm, try to group those faces into different groups, you know, and, you know, uh, that is probably the groups may, you know, some ethnic backgrounds may be part of specific groups. And sometimes you may be uh, I mean, the nationality versus ethnicity, and when you look at face recognition, it's like the facial structures would be more prominent uh, in uh, grouping them. So today's talk is more about unsupervised machine learning. And uh, this is from uh, Boyer paper, and this is like a follow-up work on this paper, which was about um, published early in 2020 as the COVID, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic began. So and they, they used unsupervised machine learning and the goal was to visualize how close are some of the strains and variants. So this is just a figure from their paper, basically giving the overview of COVID-19. And I don't know if this bat issue has been resolved. You guys may know better than me. <laughs> So the data set, uh, uh, we are following using the same data set sources from their papers, the GSID, which is Global Initiative on Sharing Avian Influenza Data, uh, which most of you may be knowing, and it's quite a popular portal and uh, one of the largest in the world. Uh, 12 million uh, strains are there. From there, we selected 250 randomly selected SARS-CoV-2 isolates and uh, we selected uh, five variants, so 50 each from alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and Omicron. And uh, because we just selected it without having any bias to the country and so on. 
somehow, although we randomly selected some countries were represented more than the others. And this is just the top, top eight of the 25 countries that are represented in the data set. Um, the country information is important. And this is just 250 is just a very small portion of the data. This is just to show how our code framework works. And basically that can increase, you know, thousands of strains and across different countries, you know, and there's a lot of post, a lot of work can be done on that to see how the, uh, you know, uh, different variants are moving around the different countries. So note that um, the selection of the, uh, the data set, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and omicron, this is like the strains are labeled. So this is like a type of, we can also do supervised machine learning, supervised machine learning on this. But we are going to assume that we, you know, the labels are going to be used just to check how good the unsupervised machine learning framework is. So, uh, and KMI analysis is uh, quite, quite fundamental to uh, processing the genome sequences. And uh, basically, as we know that with machine learning, we cannot uh, give the DNA slash RNA type of data to machine learning algorithms. They need, they will work only with the numbers, right? So we need a way to ensure that the RNA sequence is converted to some sort of data that basically, so that we can run these machine learning algorithms. And basically the KMI analysis, uh, this is from the Wikipedia page, is a very simple analysis that does a KMI frequency count of the data. So basically, uh, and the K is a question mark in the KMI frequency count. So this is for K of three. So, you know, the, the window size is the K as that's shown there. And that's K of three. Um, you can do K of 10. And the, in the KMA analysis, this K, if you write a program, just blindly writing a very, you know, program that does it. If the program is not well written, which was in our case in the beginning, we wrote it from scratch. It's not a well-written program. So the K of three for that uh, data set that I'm talking about, 250 sequence, it would take a few minutes, you know, few seconds. But if we do K of 10, then it could take one week to run it on a computer. So the K also is, and the size of the data will grow. So you'll have like, what we'll get is like, so you give this, KMI analysis um, data, 250 sequences, and uh, exactly the size number of uh, features is like around three kilobytes of data to be saved for one genome sequence, right? So there's like thousands of features there. And basically with K of three, uh, I don't remember correctly, but it's like, you'll have like 200 features or something. So you'll have like 200 by 25. But for K of 10, then that, that will increase. Uh, let me just quickly go and uh, uh, end, sorry. Mm, yeah, so the number of features. Uh, for K of three, it's 64. K of seven is 1600. So 1600 by 25, uh, 250. Whereas the first one, K of three, 64 by 250. No? So the size of the data will also increase with K my analysis. So what happens is basically we give this uh, code, a Python code. In our case, we use the R, R package for the KMI analysis uh, software written in R because that was very fast in processing. It was a very smart way to do it. So in unsupervised machine learning, there are some bigger challenges, uh, problem areas or methodologies one of them is dimensional reduction. So as I said, you know, you have like 16, if you have 1600 features, you cannot give that to a deep learning or machine learning model because that will take too long for the model to train usually. There's a lot of memory for 1600, uh, you know, 
uh, features. So you need to kind of reduce that 1600 features into a smaller set, for example. So you need to apply some type of dimensionality, dimensional reduction or dimensionality reduction methods. And principal component analysis, also known as PCA, is a well-known method for dimensional reduction. It's been there in steps uh, for more than 50 years or longer, and uh, parts of it were de developed a couple of hundred years ago and uh, so on. So basically the goal of PCA is to take a data set and reduce the number of features or re uh, get a reduced dimension of the data set. So for example, if the data set is three features, and we can visualize that as x1, x2, and x0, which you can see here. Basically, after PCA, what you get is principal components, right? And so this is like reducing a 3D data set into a two-dimensional and then doing a scatter plot of that. So basically, it's kind of looking at the data set from this angle in a way. That is, uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, PCA uses uh, different strategies to reduce and get the principal component. So then usually like in a number of problems, the size of the data, you can represent a large data set of, let's say, you know, 1000 features, usually with eight or 10 principal components. So uh, there are other types of uh, uh, data reduction uh, methods, dimensionality reduction methods. And another one is called TSNE, which is very popular in bioinformatics. And uh, TSNE basically uh, is nonlinear dimensional reduction method. It has some more advantages over PCA. It's an extension of the SNE algorithm, which is known as the stochastic neighbor embedding is widely used in the domain of medicine and bioinformatics. And it, you can, uh, the thing with the uh, PCA is that uh, you get a series of principal components and you will know like how much of the first principal component or second principal component represents how much of, of your data. Whereas in TSNE, you don't get that. You will only have two or three dimensions. And a TSNE is usually used for visualizing the data. So the, the thing is here, as you can see here, your, this is three-dimensional data, right? But oh, dimensions means features. If there's like more than three, then our human mind, we can't really easily represent it. So nobody usually shows four or five dimensions. <laughs> so... Uh, unless you are doing some work in string theory, I guess <laughs> those guys like 11 dimensions, right? <laughs> so uh, the thing is uh, when you, you, you can get the first three dimensions with PCA, you, can, you, you will get the number of principal components and that can be 10 or it can be 20 principal component depending on the data. And what principal component analysis will tell you that, hey, first principal component represents 80% of the data. Second principal component will represent 10% uh, of the data. Third represents five or two percent of the data. So as the principal components increase, the you know the uh, it's known as the variance ratio that reduces. So usually people take the first two principal components and they just do a scatter plot, and that's basically used for visualizing, right? And then the principal components, like the, let's say the 10 principal components, which rep may represent 98% of the data. So rather than people giving a data set with 1000 features to you, the machine learning model for training, they would give just the 10 principal components. So that's what it means that you have a reduced data set, right? So there's two advantages of PC. Once you get, one is that you get these principal components which you use a reduced data set and then you give to machine learning, they train faster. This PCA method actually as well, it's also well known to remove noise from data. You know, sometimes your data set may have no noisy features, components, it's not well documented or collected. Then sometimes PCA removes that. So you'll have, instead of using the whole data set, you're using 98% or 95%. And that can, sometimes people, not just it 
you have a computational advantage rather than waiting for you know, two days for your machine learning model to train, you could have you know, one or two hours or one or two minutes, depending on the data. But sometimes your also machine learning models accuracy also improves when you have a PCA step because it reduces, removes some of the noise from the data, okay? So it takes the important, you can think of PCA as something that reduces the size of the data and takes the important points out from the data. And so, but PSEA is known, has challenges in uh, different types of data. Some of the, you know, the data needs to have, you know, be linear and it needs to be, it, it shouldn't uh, be uh, sparse, but that's why there's a lot of methods have been developed and TSNE is one of them to address some of the issues of PCA. So here, what we see is, uh, this is uh, based on MNIST data set. Actually, this is character recognition data, right? And uh, that is, this is image data actually. So it's like handwritten characters, handwritten characters from zero to nine. And basically it's a machine learning benchmark. And basically, you apply PCA or TSNE on it, and then you do a 2D scatter plot of the first two components. It can be PCA to SNE. And then you can see something like that. And you here we see nine or 10 patches. But sometimes, like uh, some characters, like in, uh, because this is handwritten character recognition. So sometimes, even with us, when we see other people's handwriting, if you see my handwriting, it's really terrible. Uh, you may have difficulty to recognize six and nine usually, you know, it may be, you know, so, so this is what it's trying to say that there are some of these clusters which will look very similar and that's uh, humans also have difficulty and machine learning methods also have difficulty in, you know, discriminating uh, very close uh, things that look very similar. So UMAP is one of the other dimensional reduction methods and uh, it employs a conceptual structure according to the Riemannian geometry and algebraic topology. Uh, we were just talking about um, how difficult it is to work in the area of pure mathematics, but uh, these guys are computer science guys and statisticians, they usually use some of those advancements to develop computer science and statistical algorithms. So, uh, and it has been comparable to TSNE, uh, visualization co quality and so on. And it doesn't have computational restrictions and so on. And I think this is a good paper that you can see, which compared TSNE, UMAP and UMAP, and it's published in Nature Biotechnology 2019. Uh, so you can see that on some type of uh, data set, uh, single uh, cell data. So you can visualize single cell data, genome data, and all these different types of omics data sets as well with all these methods, basically. And you can see that the types of visualizations are a bit different, but they do have the same the occurring theme usually. So here you see UMAP and TSNE, and I think these guys are saying that UMAP is better, better for this type of single cell data, basically. So uh, if you do not want to try TSNE, you write that, hey, these guys have written and done it, so that is better. And then the reviewer in the journal does not agree with you, then you tell them again, hey, this is the paper, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's all about dimensional reduction is basically about uh, reducing and visualizing data, right? For machine learning and for other purposes. Uh, so the other part of supervised and unsupervised learning is clustering. And again here, clustering is basically if you have raw data, you want to basically group them into across uh, different categories and you are going to look at data, features of the data. So here you see the red, and uh, the, the, the pear and the strawberries are all grouped based on similarity measure. So you'll compare each uh, data with the other and based on those that are more similar to each other, you put in specific groups. 
And basically, this is uh, these ideas can be extended to, um, uh, you know, you can think of these apples as uh, alpha, beta, and Omicron variants of, of COVID-19. So a type of clustering algorithm is Agnes, and it's also known as hierarchical agglomerate clustering. And Agnes uh, provides a better approach. Uh, so one of the conventional algorithms is k-means algorithm uh, clustering. And k-means basically has also a k similar to k-my analysis. And for different types of data set, you need to evaluate different values of k and find the right value for k. And that can be computationally challenging. Whereas agglomerate clustering, you do not have to specify the value of k. It basically develops a, has a hierarchical approach. So for example, this is uh, demonstrating uh, K-means or uh, Agnes clustering where, because the thing is you do you may not have the time or you do not, uh, your data will not be in 2D space all the time, right? Whereas this is just a two dimensional data. So you in, I mean, looking at the data, we know that the number of, uh, components is three is we, we have three good groups here so k should be three but if you did not have this visualization of the data you want to use k means clustering then you'll have to evaluate for k of two three four five and then take the best one you know so whereas is the agglometrif or the agnes clustering um you have two things you have not only the clusters, but you also get an information diagram known as a dendrogram that shows how close are the clusters to each other and what are the clusters within the clusters. So rather than you getting a uh, you know labeling just based on k of three, here you just need to put a take a horizontal rule. If you put a horizontal rule there, you'll see one, two, three, four five, six, seven, eight clusters. You know, you can group your data into eight clusters. If you take a horizontal rule there, then that's three clusters. And you can see uh, this here visually. So this is the, this is all the background for the unsupervised machine learning framework, which you see here. Uh, in here, basically, Sorry, I made a mistake. This is not NCBI, but it's GS8 is our data source. So I need to correct that in my paper, which is in archive. Uh, yeah. And uh, so we extract the data basically, and this, and then you get this COVID-19 RNA sequences. So we got the 50 each from there, but you can always have 500 or 5,000 each of these. If you have uh, good computational resources, you can run it for larger data sets, see things all around the world, different countries. So we do k my analysis. We first check what is the good value for K in k my frequency analysis by evaluating different values of K using k my analysis and then doing a PCA on it. And then we also compare, you take the same KMA data and we compare PCA, TSNE, UMAP. And basically then we visualize the variance. So the goal of this uh, project was to compare the different dimensionality reduction method and also evaluate what is a good value for KMA analysis with a small data set. So that when you run uh, it on a larger data set across the world, you do not have to evaluate for the value of k anymore, and you do not have to say, ah, should I use other PCA or UMAP? You know, you can just take the conclusions from this paper and run it on that large data set. And then we also run clustering and compare the clustering approach, where we do a PCA and then clustering, and another one is where we just do clustering by itself and show visualization in terms of dendrograms. And as I said earlier about the PCA, with PCA basically you can report something known as the scree plot. The scree plot is like so you have this data set where you have 160 or 1600 features, and basically you your PCA will basically give you all these uh, principal components and it will also give 
this, this information, which is called the proportion of variance uh, uh, of variance uh, ratio. Uh, and basically that basically means, what this means here in this purple one. So the purple one actually, sorry, I do not have the legends here, but the purple one is K of three, then the red one is K of five in the KMA analysis. And the blue one is K of seven, actually. Okay, so the K of seven is the data set is very uh, large. It has sixteen hundred features. So basically, uh, if you apply PCA, which means that just the first two components would be representing. So it's like the first one is representing around fifty five percent of the data. The second one is representing around. Uh, 10% of the data. So just the first two components are representing around, uh, oh, I have it here. Uh, first two components are representing around uh, 53 plus seven, around 60% of the data, 61% of the data. And the first five components represent 75% of the data. But if your value of K is uh, larger, it's representing less of the data. And basically you want that your first two or three components to represent as much as possible because that will give you more insight to the visualization process, you know? So from this, basically we see that if you want to do KMI analysis, it's best that you use a value of K of three, which basically uh, in the this paper in the beginning, which I showed um, where our work is based on, and this is a CSIRO work, in this paper, they used the value of K of 10. And they had uh, to wait for a longer time as well. And whereas here we are basically evaluating the value for K and we are saying that, hey, you do not have to wait longer time. You don't need to have to use too much of memory space. You value of K, which is very simple, faster and gives you more meaningful information. And then moving on, let's uh, try to uh, see how this actually is when we visualize the data. That is like uh, with PCA, we see a uh, K of three, then that is um, the first two components, of course, they represent around 60% or so, but we see that there's a lot of overlap between alpha and um, and gamma in this category, you know, we see the Omicron is quite different from these ones. But if we use other visualization or data, data dimensional reduction methods for K of three, such as UMAP and TSNE, we find that the UMAP is better in discriminating the variance with K of three. Uh, even uh, actually, TSNE with K of three is not doing well as it's mixing Omicron with the alpha and the beta. So, whereas uh, if you want to use TSNE, your K should be five. So you see K of five, the TSNE is better, UMAP is better, but PCA is like improved a bit in here. But note that the PCA, this is like uh, the, it's, this is also, not that good because it's representing a lower, explaining a lower portion of the data, 16% plus 8.8%. Then we have PCA with K of seven, which is a lot of features. And um, here too, there's a lot of overlaps here. And uh, we have UMAP and TSNE, K of five and K of seven, they were quite good in discriminating the data. And overall winner is basically UMAP in, in all of them, basically for 357, it has been very robust. Whereas uh, the conclusions are changing with PCA quite a lot. So if you want to use, uh, uh, do genome analysis with uh, RNA data, then it's UMAP basically according to this study is the way to go. And in with UMAP, it doesn't matter if your case should be three, five or seven, so you can just go, uh, save your time and memory space by using K of three. As you can see that uh, also the, this is just a computational time in uh, seconds. And here basically we see that uh, PCA is taking much longer to do the analysis when it is K seven, but uh, 
UMAP is scaling much better. And TSNE is somehow quite a bit weird that with 64 features, it took more time and it became less. Um, I don't know. We have to look into this uh, uh, and try to explain what is going on if we look at the algorithm. So as I showed earlier that there's the issue with dendrograms, and this is the dendrograms that we use Agnes hierarchical clustering, and we see how this, uh, you know, variants of concern, how they are related to each other, and we see different, uh, you know, clusters uh, being formed um, in the data. And uh, this is when we applied PCA first, and then we did uh, uh, apply the Agnes clustering and did dendrograms. And if you compare them, we see that uh, the conclusions change quite a lot. Uh, the, it's in this case, we think that it is not a good approach to use PCA as a dimensional reduction method for chi of three, because what happens is uh, the dendrograms uh, basically, the thing is with PCA here we are using, it's only the data that it's using is 95% uh, the principal components explain 95% of the data. So basically that 5% information is quite useful that PCA has ignored to actually have a better visualization. So uh, again, this is a follow-up work from uh, Boya paper and basically uh, Professor Sheshadri Vasan and Dr. Lawrence uh, Wilson is part of this paper in uh, the archive version and they have been part of this project. So we have been always comparing with their previous paper. So this is the first study and this was not looking at the variance, but this was like looking at actual, the name of this uh, variance, you know? So uh, this is uh, basically using K of 10 and uh, basically our next step would be to do something like this and then uh, show different countries, you know, where the clusters are in different countries or we just look at Australia and then see how we could probably have a map of Australia and show where the different variants mostly have been, something like that. So we can use similar approach like this uh, and get some information like this and then tag the you know geolocation of the viruses and then project it on a map. So that's some of the one of the future stuff that uh, we would like to do. So and basically, as I said earlier, that uh, one of the major conclusions is that UMAP is uh, very robust and uh, compared to PCA and TSNE, and it doesn't matter uh, what value of K you use, whereas in, uh, uh, we know that it is reasonable not to go further than K of seven because you will comp use computational more resources and time. Uh, this, uh, just a preprint of this paper is in, uh, archive, but we are uh, going to update it and try to put uh, some information over the different countries for the same data set and uh, show uh, improve the visualizations further. So thanks to the team and Lawrence and Sheshadri and Mingyu who is doing her master's in this uh, somehow uh, photo is not aligned. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes. Um, any questions or comments? Any questions from the people on Zoom? That would be that would be interesting, but I think that would be like combining it with some other deep learning approaches and uh, yeah, so yeah, how it is going to mutate. Uh, yeah, I wonder what type of what work is already there. I mean, that's like a gold yeah. <laughs> standard <laughs> for <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm trying to get my head around how this relates to, I guess, more conventional goals and those benchmarks. 
Yeah, and that's where, what... where, where it's yeah, it's it's you know just building a, yeah. a fairly straightforward statistical model of the the the, the deep evolutionary generative process that um, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm so not sure what your thoughts on that are. I'm not sure I can get that. I think I think we. I think it would be good if we compare our dendrograms with uh, yeah absolutely analysis yeah. and yeah. show side by side of how they are performing probably mm. that could be something that will yeah. add more weight to this uh, project yeah, yeah. because yeah. Uh, the dendrogram is used mostly more on the machine learning side and it's not really that popular in the bioinformatics uh, side I mean it's quite popular well, but yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, so yeah I think yeah, yeah so that, that sort of yeah. But not the gold standard. Well, it's, yeah. it's, it's it's the it's the primary kind of outcome, and yeah, and, yeah, and I think yeah, you've got kind of natural comparison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I guess the other the other thing I was wondering is is whether you know you find that a plus three works well when k is obviously a special number when it comes to to the the the, the words of, of of DNA or RNA. So. Um, it, I guess it's, it's hard to distinguish that from from the simple um, combinatorics of, 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 of mm. feature size, but um, yeah. it's Do you align it with the amino acid groups of three, or would you do every single three like one step away? It's a sliding window. It's like, yeah. So it's effectively, it's all, it's yeah. effectively reading each, each reading frame, um, which I don't, don't know in the past code, but in sort of this the, 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 the transcript is read multiple reading frames. So, yeah. um, but, um, uh, but in, in principle, you know, then trying to map it to a a genetic code and and, yeah. and and so yeah it's kind of one of the other questions is whether you get a significantly different result if you did um you know map the three most back to back to the genetic code and, and reduce your, your feature feature set yeah we were trying to do something along those lines where we were synthetically generating or we're taking just one of the synthetically creating mutations like different mutations mm -hmm on one of the sequences and then uh, apply this to see how the visualizations change but um, the, because the schema is more of a frequency count mm -hmm. and you basically get a data table after doing schema analysis if you do mutations the that data table does not change that much mm -hmm. Right. So, and it's not really that important for machine learning. This is a mutation you are looking at one gene in this long chain changing, and that's a very small thing to detect for machine learning. And if you're doing KMA analysis, because it's more of a kind of a way to summarize that information, and that doesn't really capture small changes, you know. So, we, we need uh, maybe the K my analysis type or something on top of K my analysis, or we need to redevelop that K my analysis mm -hmm. so that it is more sensitive to mutations in the case of genomes. So, I mean, one way people are doing that in um, in terms of uh, amino acid sequences, so protein protein analysis, is it's by training with generative models, and so the idea there is that you essentially feed it all of the protein sequences and you give it a protein up to residue X and you ask the machine learning algorithm to predict the next residue sequence. Uh, and you can train the, the, the algorithm to get as good as it can get at that. And that becomes a way of constructing a representation that can be insightful in terms of you know, the constraints on, 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 on protein sequence. I'm not sure how well that would work in in a in a four level language. The, the, 
yeah. the odds of success are somewhat better. Um, um, but um, but yeah, I, mean, I think that's potentially. Mm. Okay, so maybe I can just close the recording for now.